Um, so our first speaker is uh, Isabella uh, Puss uh, from, uh, from uh, is it Leuven? Okay, Leuven. Um, so uh, over to you. Thank you very much for this introduction. Um, indeed, welcome. I am Isabella Huiswasser from of, um, Pharmaceutical Sciences and Intellectual Property Rights at the University of Leuven in Belgium, and also affiliated with the Center of IP uh, at the same university. Um, we have actually there at the university a research group on regulatory sciences and intellectual property rights, and uh, where different uh, PhDs also perform research in that area actually on market access of um, human medicinal products and more specifically focusing on the regulatory framework around market access uh, of medicinal products. And I also want to present uh, Stephanie Bruce, who is actually my PhD student and uh, collaborating with the European Centre for a uh, European Organization for Cancer Research and Therapies and uh, performing a PhD on actually public-private partnerships in the clinical domain um, and uh, where she will present at the end research results from her own research in the context of personalized medicine and data sharing. To start with, um, we use actually more the term precision medicine instead of the term personalized medicine, meaning um, that we uh, are not uh, talking uh, directly to the persons themselves, but more to the uh, precise therapy, sometimes also to more than one particular uh, person, but this is a minor side remark. I want here to start off or to kick off with a slide demonstrating to use some figures why it is useful actually to think of precision medicine in the first place. And you see here an overview of different types of diseases with the rate of efficacy of the current treatment strategies that are there. And you see that um, especially for cancer, only 25% of the current available therapies work for these people. And um, if you then know that, for instance, for particular cancer types like pan pancreas, uh, cancer, the, the overall survival of one year is only 24%, then you can uh, understand that these people cannot wait until a trial and an error of what particular therapy works for them. So that they really need very urgently access to a therapy that works for them. So that's why and where we are with precision medicine. We have uh, where the concept is that you have uh, several people with diagnosed with a particular cancer. However, we know that not all drugs work for all these people. So that actually we need to divide the groups, to stratify the groups and see, okay, for those people, the drug does not work, the non-responders. And for the other group, uh, the drug works, um, but, um, so for, sorry, sorry for, the, for, for one group there is a non-responder group or for, uh, um, and there are people that maybe the drug works but has too much side effects and then for the other group the drug works with no severe side effects. And this is actually a major uh, step that needs to be taken and for that you ne we need actually um, tools that can make this happening. Um, namely screening platforms that can be used for instance uh, where uh, when we have heard us also the, the talk about um, genomics um, where uh, people can be where the, the genomes of people can be screened and then you can stratify the people before for instance entering a trial making this trial much more clinical uh, uh, eff effective or when it is uh, in a treatment setting where companion diagnostics uh, can be used along a drug where first the patient is diagnosed with a particular diagnostic and then only then receives this particular drug. But for that it is important that um, in order to make that happening, a companion diagnostic which functions, that um, a right biomarker is found and that this biomarker is also validated, meaning that it is workable in that particular um, uh, uh, population. 
And how can we find the right validated biomarker in order to develop a companion diagnostic, for instance, or this screening platform that can help making this uh, concept of precision medicine work? Well, actually, we need then uh, to have access to data, and this is what the talk of today is all about. You see here a drug life cycle where um, you have the different steps of the discovery of the drug and preclinical research on animals, which actually informs um, the studies on humans in phase one, phase two, phase three. And um, all the results of the phase two, phase three efficacy and safety trials needs to, uh, yeah, uh, to um, inform the uh, regulatory authorities for marketing authorization as well as uh, reimbursement agencies. Different data are collected at these different phases. And in the clinical trial phases, a lot, or most of the time, the data that is collected is very controlled, randomized controlled cl clinical trial data with very strict populations, um, in, with inclusion criteria and so on. Uh, uh, the data is there collected as well as samples of humans where, where research is, is done upon. And this is collected by sp sponsors, which might be industri industry, but also by academic, academics, because sometimes the people, the academics, run the trials. And these data then are stored either um, at, these, at, the, at these centers themselves, in biobanks, um, or in other, in other uh, registers at their, at their premises. Um, other type of data that is collected might be real-world data. That's the data that is collected once the drug is on the market, not in a very strict study design uh, sample of patients, but just in the real world. And um, this is also with patient-reported outcomes data, where patients also report uh, how the treatment goes. <coughs> this data is collected sometimes by the government. For instance, uh, think of sickness funds or so. They do it within their duty, collect all the time real-world data about the use of drugs and what this does with the patient. But also sponsors in terms of pharmacovigilance obligations. They need to collect side effects of drugs and so on. Um, then we have also, for instance, the, the, the DTC, so the uh, diagnostic companies, the, the direct-to-consumer companies, who also uh, collect data uh, from patients when they send their samples to them in order to ask for a test. And patients themselves think of mobile health uh, applications, they also uh, collect data. So you see that the real world data that is all out there is collected by several uh, stakeholders. Okay. It is very interesting, all this data, and if this data would be used to re-inform these uh, clinical trials, then you could make the clinical trials much more smarter. And then we are in the area of adaptive uh, trials. I don't know whether you have heard of the adaptive um, pathways of EMA, but which makes that, yeah, you, we will approve a drug not for the whole, all the indications, but for very um, selective uh, indications, one after the other. And um, this also opens the door towards, uh, towards a more adaptive approach in reimbursement, meaning managed entry agreements uh, where um, the drug is, re is reimbursed based on its performance on the market. And, um, but this brings us um, actually to, uh, yeah, to the access of the data. And some data is collected in terms of, for, for instance, by the governments because of their duty. Others are collected based on the fact that the sponsor, for instance, has IP rights or the, the DTCs have IP rights and they have access to these samples and they control actually not only the, the, the products but also all data collected within these samples. So the data is very important, interesting, but data and data is not the same. And that's what also Timo says. It is about, um, sometimes you have the aggregated data, sometimes you have patient level data, and is all real world data so qualitative as we need? No. So it's very difficult to, um, yeah, to, to have, to know which data is then good or not. In any case, it's here about personal data, sometimes also anonymous data, and human biological material, which is necessary to find the right biomarkers, because all these data contain the potential biomarkers in order to make a companion diagnostics. 
when we talk about personal, da personal data, so not anonymized data, but personal data, um, we come in a situation that um, for sharing, we need to respect certain uh, legislations and sharing is a type of processing. And processing is something which is governed by diverse legal frameworks. Um, processing of personalized data. Very complex legal frameworks where we have the regulation, the GDPR uh, coming up and which actually leaves some possibilities of doing research and finding biomarkers um, in the end, however, it is also um, up to several member states on how you can collect the data, what with informed consents, um, and especially uh, what with the samples that are also needed. Because maybe for data we have um, several rules out there, but for samples that's still another story. And we see the, the effect of that uh, very good. So you see there are legal grounds for sharing data, although these are very complex, but in reality data is not shared that, uh, that much, and especially not when we think of, of therapies. Uh, you see here, for instance, the, the Gleevec therapy, where, um, it's, uh, yeah, where initially the, pa the, the drug was given to lots of patients, and much, much more later the diagnosticum came out, uh, saying, oh, you know, it's only for this limited amount of uh, small number of patients that the drug actually is, is meant to. And the same uh, story is for er Erbitux, where uh, initially the, the, the drug was approved for many types of colorectal patients, but then later on, much later on, only that, that test was there, um, saying that actually in the end only 40% of these colorectal cancer patients could be treated with that drug and that, uh, that you needed, it took three years, more than three years, before the original data could be reanalyzed re in order to find the biomarker and actually uh, yeah, um, uh, save these, these patients both from being treated or for treatment that does not work for them or maybe makes side effects. And this is since these data, which need to be reanalyzed, remains within the walls, for instance, of study sponsors. So in order to make precision medicine happening, there is a need for access to data, and um, which can be made be available by the legal frameworks, but there is also a change of mentality needed, and also Timo has clarified this as, uh, uh, well, as well, but uh, Stefanie will show you what stakeholders think of uh, opening up and actually providing, or what are the sorrows, um, what is the reluctance actually of, of, uh, of access to their samples, to their no, to samples and data. But there are also other um, aspects to that, namely, if you, if you go in that direction of uh, precision medicine, there is a reluctance with pharma that, yeah, that their market will shrine, that their market will be limited, um, and this will, yeah, this is not from a commercial point of view um, the most attractive point. Another thing is that the moment that you think of having 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 uh, have, having identified the right biomarker and you would develop a companion diagnostic, you face with several regulatory and legal problems, and that's also what the colleague here uh, expressed to you. So the, there are separate organizations dealing with a com with a regulatory approval of a companion diagnostics. Um, different legislations that apply to them. In Europe, there is an upcoming more stringent legislation there. Um, different timelines there, different timelines also for, for reimbursement. And this means that when the drug is maybe reimbursed, but the diagnosticum is not reimbursed, or vice versa, then, yeah, then the, the, the precision medicine in reality has no meaning. So this is a really, a really a big problem at the moment for companion diagnostics um, development. And also, yeah, the, uh, the lack of expertise that there is uh, in order to, to develop those companion diagnostics. So there are risks uh, in order to invest in companion diagnostic development and in, uh, and in precision medicine. And how can we then create a situation of de-risking, uh, of de-risk? Is it with IP? Well, we have seen also in this, in this uh, conference that lots of IP exists for pharma, for, for pharmaceutical products, and I know there are some, 
some uncertainties whether the genes, whether the, uh, whether how to patent the second medical indications and how and when and so on. But at least patents are there, supplementary protection certificates are there, other types of IP trademarks and so on, regulatory uh, exclusivities. For the, company, for the companion diagnostics, patents are also there, also with certain um, uh, highlights here and there. Uh, but there is no supplementary protection certificate protection there and also no regulatory exclusivities uh, which might be available. Um, there are, however, trade secrets which turn out, and we have heard this today, this, these are very, very important and that contracts play a, a big role. And then we can think of, yes, okay, is this enough or is this not enough? We have not heard that there is a lack of IP in that sentence um, in this conference, but this on the other hand, you should, you should consider if we would give more IP to, for instance, companion diagnostic in the area of companion diagnostic, what is then the uh, influence on the sharing of the data and actually on the, on the, 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 the position of them? Um, so it's actually a research word. But what we, another way of thinking of what we see also is that companion diagnostics collaborate much more with um, the medical product producers themselves. And we see this with Herceptin and the Hercept test, where, uh, these two, where there was an agreement, an exclusive agreement between Genentech and DACO on producing a test and the, the drug actually in parallel, where the test is immediately validated in the trial of the drug developer. Which has, uh, and this, uh, this is with two different companies. Sometimes it's done within one company, for instance, with Zelborav and, and the Brav uh, test. Um, but is this the right way? Yeah, and, we, and we see also that these co development uh, trajectories actually increase. Um, we have done several case studies on that, demonstrating that companies, companion diagnostics and pharma, collaborate much more with each other. But this is actually, yeah, this represents an exclusive relationship with each other. And we have also heard today that, yeah, is this the way we need to go with this exclusive relationship uh, with two companies? They share amongst each other a lot of data, but it's, it remains an exclusive relationship. So, yes, um, in the US at least, they support this co-development uh, way of developing precision medicine. There are um, papers, concept papers, supporting how this needs to be done in practice. Uh, on the other hand, we see also that there is a development of, of transparency measures, where um, also, the, uh, where aside from the data protection regulations and so on, uh, and the clinical trial regulation, uh, several other instruments are there to make publicly accessible data. So not within a too bilat bilateral uh, way, but publicly accessible database of results. And we see also that indeed EMA is more into a policy mood of um, sharing, actually fostering the companies to, uh, to share with each other data and to share with the community data. And FPA is the European Federation of Pharmaceutical Industries also has uh, its own principles of data sharing because they also uh, recognize that it is needed to um, to share the data and actually, especially to fa for this biomarker research. But it's all about data and what with samples. Eh? Um, and we think that actually with respect to samples, there is also lots of work to do. But there are sorrows, uh, concerns of stakeholders. And that's why I want to give the word to Stephanie who can explain what, is, uh, what it is with, uh, what the research says about the concerns of stakeholders in this data sharing. Said. Huh? I'm not sure if there is a uh, time to within to. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. 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 No, no, she can present. Oh, yeah. So time now. Okay. Um, so in this process, I will be talking to you uh, about data sharing in the clinical trial context, and there are a lot of um, stakeholders involved actually in this process, from the patients who are the donors of these data and samples, up to the researchers who want to re-access the data and the clinical databases and the biobanks established by study sponsors to do further research. Um, and so to um, objectively scope these opinions of the different stakeholders, we conducted two rounds of interviews. And the first round of interviews um, uh, concerned a number of uh, experts, uh, except for the patients actually. And so in total, um, 32 interviews were conducted with um, a balanced set of stakeholders, including 
uh, industry representatives, uh, people with an academic background and um, other, a group of other stakeholders including patient organizations, regulatory organizations and so on. And so um, there are an important number of reasons why data and sharing is actually important. The moral reasons, for instance, vis-a-vis -vis the study patients who participate really in research, not only to get access to the experimental medicine, but also to make their samples and data available for future research and for, for altruistic purposes, actually. Um, and there are, of course, the scientific reasons to expand our knowledge and the societal reasons to only pay for the, the treatment of those patients that are actually working. And also actually a number of economic reasons favoring data sharing were mentioned. For instance, that if we, there would be a collective vision that data sharing would be done, then this would um, lead to faster trials, uh, smarter trials, um, a, less, a lot less duplication and a good use of all these available resources actually that are already there. And similar arguments were actually given for samples, however, um, this was even found more importantly because uh, the value that can be extracted from a sample is much higher. The data set, they are there, you can look at them differently or apply a new statistical analysis, but from the sample you can actually go back and extract more genetic information. And today often the sharing of samples is left out of the debate. Um, but more importantly, or more interesting actually, are exactly what are the concerns that limit uh, stakeholders actually today for sharing. And the most important reason was mentioned that they fear losing control over the database or the biobanks. Um, for instance, to protect against misuse, because statistical significance is a volatile situation. You can apply a different statistical um, method and then you can... There are people with preconceived ideas actually who try to prove that a medicine is not working and companies want to protect themselves against that or to protect uh, against publicizing possibly poorly conducted research, which is not such a good argument, but it is also given by um, a different range of uh, stakeholders. And I want to illustrate this by an example. There was an acad um, a scientist that I interviewed and he said at so a certain moment I had an idea in my laboratory, we had an idea of a new biomarker uh, and he went to a clinician saying I've got this idea, I want to test it, I want to reanalyze a large clinical trial and see if there is a, a, a yeah, treatment, a population group that responds better. So they went to the company and they asked if they could, re if they could analyze, reanalyze a database and a biobank. It took them eventually two years to discuss this and there were a lot of uh, um, conversations with lawyers involved and the, the scientist told me actually it was more going about legal aspects instead of science, which he didn't really like. But after two years he was able to get the data, and the data and the samples. And so he said what was also important for him was that he would, um, would be the first author on the publication that would result from the, this study. And that he said we managed to come to an agreement that there was shared IP, so that his name was on the patent application, but that a company gets an exclusive lines to the outcome of this, um, <coughs> to, to this research. However, um, at some point he said, I got all the samples, and there were 250 samples included, and 20 of them were not even human. And these are, um, <laughs> And these are data and samples that we, as a society, are, these are the clinical trials are based actually on these kind of data and samples. So it really is actually a reason to push for more data and uh, transparency, but also transparency on the samples, because this should not be allowed. Uh, and he also referred to this process actually it's like doing business and it should not be like doing business because you want to do science and you're treating human samples and so on. It's not only true for industry, it's also true for academic hospitals who tend to hold on to their data set. Um, something interesting we also found is that the protective approach of study sponsors tend to vary across the drug life cycle. For instance, you see here in A that when um, in dr under drug development, companies don't like to share their data because then they lose the control. However, they do have an interest in finding the biomarker because at that point the market shares get smaller but they can still adjust the price of the medicine. So the, medic uh, the price gets up. So they tend to uh, go and enter into collaborations to do more thorough uh, translational um, biomarker research. Research. However, when the drug is on the market and it has an established price, they do not want anybody to touch the database or the biobank because then the, the, the price is set and then if there is another biomarker, they tend to just lose revenues. However, at the end of patent protection, a lot of scientists said then I could very easily get access to the data and the samples because they just lose their interest in the medicine. So they also concerned that if uh, data sharing would be mandated, that it would, be, that it would impact the, or deteriorate the incentives to invest in research. 
in a competitive environment, it's really important um, that uh, the protection of valuable information is really important because it secures a, a return on investment. And the same is true for academic researchers because it allows them to be the, prior, uh, the pr primary author on a publication, for instance. However, considering the benefits for science and for the public, um, many stakeholders that I interviewed said we have to actually rethink our current competitive models that are based on exclusivity and on uh, com um, uh, confidentiality on the one hand to st that are actually now uh, incentives to stimulate in research and um, with the accessibility of data and samples that also stimulates research. So, and in this respect, it was really interesting because I talked to a biotech uh, representative of whom I would think that they were very protective over their data set because they don't have so many assets. And he told me, actually, to be honest, the confidential aspects or the, the, the important aspects for us, they are not in our primary clinical data or the samples. It's more on the novel target mechanisms or novel, um, novel modes of action or everything that's besides the primary data. It's the analysis, the statistical analysis plans, the clinical trial dossiers that you submit to regulatory, uh, regulatory authorities and these things, but not really the data. And considering that it's so important to share them, he pushed for really for greater sharing. Uh, a number of privacy and data prote uh, protection reasons were also um, mentioned to be limiting um, sharing. Uh, most importantly, issues with the informed consent that was already mentioned today. And there are still a number of pragmatic Im impediments, for instance, that it's very costly to structure the data and to give it. And this is more true for samples because it's very costly to ship biobanks, for instance. And samples finite nature actually are an extra dimension because you cannot share them indefinitely. After a certain while, the sample is just finished. Um, and then um, I also asked the opinion on a certain amount of controlled access me mechanisms that are uh, available today. Um, Timo Minson also referred to them. Uh, companies have some models through which they already share clinical data. Um, not a lot of people were aware of this. Um, and besides, when I explained this to them, they said that they liked the fact that this um, introduces procedural transparency and it obligates a um, a mo to motivate a decision why access would be allowed or not allowed. Um, and industry representatives also like this mechanism because they said, for us, it's a, it's a controlled way. So we give our data to somebody else and it allows us, it's, si it's like a portal, it allows us to give feedback on why we did certain things with the, data, with the database. Um, however, it was deplored that these are still fragmented efforts. So if you want to simultaneously access data from a number of sponsors, you have to go to different uh, databases. And it does not include genetic or genomic data and samples today. So we also talked to patients. This was rather exploratory. Only 16 interviews were held with patients who have cancer who are participating in the clinical trial. So we went to the hospital for when these patients got uh, their treat, experimental treatment and we talked to them and we asked them actually what they found about uh, the sharing and reuse of data and samples. First of all, it's interesting to note that none of the patients actually made a distinction between uh, sharing data or samples and that all um, patients actually said that they allow their data and samples to be used for further reuse, for further uh, scientific research purposes. And they even encourage it because they say, I do not participate for myself, it's also for further science and so on. However, if we ask that it would be a different researcher that would use or re uh, reuse the data, uh, three patients were more reluctant and one patient even went so far in say, saying that she would like to be reconsented in such a case. Um, 11 of the patients said they would like to be informed about uh, future studies that would be done with their samples and data or for instance to get the results of studies and this is actually not really respected today. There is, uh, and I asked industri uh, industry uh, representatives about it and they say there is no connection that we have with the patients so we cannot even go back to give them the results. So I think here is room for more uh, research to update the consent process actually to establish a more interactive way with the patients. Um, and then we asked the idea of what people would feel if there would be an ethics committee in their place deciding on the reuse. Um, and many people feel that would trust in such a system. Um, some people said I'm, that they don't even feel themselves so knowledgeable to make these decisions, so they would rather trust in an ethics committee to do this. However, there was one person that said, I wouldn't trust in such a, a system, so I really want to make the decision myself. Um, on the more interactive e-consent tool that we explained to them, the opinions were also divided. Some people said it would be good because current tools lack uh, granularity and people have no control as was where their data and samples are going whatsoever. However, many patients said that they are not online considering that the average age is quite high, it's probably normal. 
Um, and then lastly, we also asked them if there was a difference between sharing with academic researchers or pharmaceutical researchers. And there were a, a number of people who said that indeed they would not feel so comfortable just sharing with pharmaceutical companies. However, it was quite low actually. And many people went so far saying that in the end, pharmaceutical companies are also bringing uh, medicines to the market. So for me, the end result is the same. And I just want medicines to help people. So I don't mind actually if you shared with academic or uh, pharmaceutical researchers. So this really um, illustrates that there is a really divergent opinions uh, when it considers the personal yeah, opinions in relation to data sharing and samples. So I would like to conclude with um, that data sharing is of utmost importance for precision medicine and it's not only data but samples should be included as well in the debate and that this requires a balancing act with the individual rights to for instance privacy and personal data protection and as well the incentives to invest in research for organizations. So and I would like to make some proposals which are up for discussion for instance. Um, that we would say that we, we would like to see more uh, early collaborations to spur biomarker research already early on so that it doesn't is that it wouldn't be too complex to do this when drugs are already on the market because companies tend to be very protective at that point so more co-development or academia industry um, uh, collaborations early on in the drug development phase and secondly to make data available through these harmonized access models which companies agree that they would feel sh uh, safe to share data in and maybe it would be interesting to make a, disti a, dis a distinction in various types uh, levels of data actually, data that is just primary patient data as, as such extracted from the patients where there are no add-ons or intellectual property re really in the data. This could be shared more easily like the samples as well and the data they are the results of statistical analysis and contain some intellectual property. I do understand that it's more sensitive to, sa to, uh, to share these because then reverse engineering could be used to see what a company is actually doing. And then, um, uh, third, um, research into more interactive um, e-consent tools would be um, good because um, pa uh, patients could give their individual preferences actually and there would be an opportunity to enhance their control over data and sample management. And lastly, I think that there is also a greater role for the public to play in the establishment of public databases and biobanks, uh, for instance like uh, the UK Biobank which is a very good in initiative in this perspective. Thank you. Mm -hmm.